Something that I want to draw out this morning from the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, there's something really, really profound here that I think is very timely for us now. One of the things that I've been doing over the last little while is revisiting some of the fundamentals of our faith, some of those foundational elements and really digging some deep wells in those places and talking about foundational elements of our faith. This first chapter of the Bible is an absolutely foundational chapter of the Bible. So much is established here, the biblical worldview, uh, and there, there is so much about this uh, first chapter of the Bible. This, well, the first section actually moves from chapter 1 into, into the beginning of chapter 2, and it's a, it's a fairly contained section. And it is absolutely profound. If, if there was ever an argument as to why you should read the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 is it. This, the, the literary sophistication of this chapter at so many levels is absolutely amazing. This chapter conveys its message not just through its content, not just through its assertions, but even through the shape, even through the patterning of the text in this chapter. And, and I, want, I want to put that on display a little bit this morning. Um, and there's so many aspects to this. I was trying to think in how to really do this in under three hours, and I don't think I can. Uh, but, but we'll give it a red-hot go. Unfortunately, some of, some of these, uh, the literary features of this chapter and, and some of the best things about this chapter, the sheer beauty, the artfulness uh, of this chapter, has tended to get lost in unfortunate debates you know, over the Bible and science. And I, unfortunately, those debates have tended to eclipse uh, really what this cha chapter really has to offer in such a multi-leveled way. To just address that, though, in very broad terms, and this is a little bit of a generalization, but in very broad terms, the Genesis chapter 1 is concerned, whereas science tends to be concerned with how and what, Genesis chapter 1 is more concerned with who and why. Now, that's, there's a bit of overlap there, and that's a little clumsy, but I think that's a good way of, of expressing the completely different concerns. Uh, it's very important that we don't come to this chapter and just be looking for just cold hard data. It's true, but it conveys its truth in the most wonderful and beautiful multi-leveled leveled way. This is rich theological prose here, and it is richly theological at so many levels as I'm going to uh, show you uh, today. One of the, the ways in which this chapter conveys uh, it, its message is through the ordering of the text. Now, the big picture of this text, and really what I'm going to get to, I'll give this away from the start. I rarely give away from the start uh, where I'm going, but I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to tell you so that I remember where I'm going as well, okay? So, <laughs> so that's the deal. This is, there is an amazing connection in this chapter between order and rest. Order and rest. Rest in the richest spiritual sense that we all need, even in the midst of everything that we do, there is something profound that this chapter says about how we reach that, and it's got a lot to do with order. In the ancient world, there, was, there is this pervasive concern about the, the, um, the powers of chaos in the world. And I think as we look at our world now, we see the powers of chaos and turmoil at work. We keep, in our global system, we keep trying to uh, repress that chaos, but it keeps bursting out, doesn't it? And in the ancient world, this was a major concern. There was always this sense, this, um, this looming chaos over, over life. And there was one of the, the, the great concerns for ancient peoples was the establishment of order, because order was uh, associated with life. Uh, patches of order in the chaos were patches of life. And it's difficult for us to understand this, actually, this concern in the ancient world, because our society is characterized by order at every level. You drive out on the road and there's traffic lights, and it's, you know, it's, it's a society of law and order, and it's all around us all the time. But in the ancient world, there were these patches of relative order, very insta unstable, but patches of relative uh, order in a very, very chaotic world that's difficult for us to imagine. 
And the issues of chaos and order were so important that the kings, uh, the, the role of, of kings in those days was to be, the, in a sense, those who created these little patches of order. Civilization in those times was understood as these little patches of order that made life possible in the midst of this most fearful chaos. And in fact, the kings tended to be... Uh, tended to be seen as divine precisely because they were seen as having this power to hold back the chaos. Now, the great symbol of chaos, uh, not only actually in the Bible, and, and it, this is kind of something that just sits so pervasively behind uh, the Bible that it's not actually ever explicitly stated, but it's pervasive. The, the ocean, the seas, the tossing turmoil of the oceans becomes the symbol throughout Scripture of the chaos. Psalm 93, the seas have lifted up, the seas have lifted up their voice, the seas have lifted up their pounding waves. It's the most, uh, it's the most colorful way that the psalmist can express the most fearful thing for ancient peoples. The seas have lifted up against us, the forces of chaos have lifted up. It's also very significant that during the period of the Exodus, that God's people passed through the sea, that, that God parted the sea and there were walls of water, it says it very explicitly, there were walls of water to the left and the right. They passed through the chaos, and of course chaos, remember, is um, also associated with death. They passed through the waters pass through the chaos with their feet on dry land. And ironically, it was Pharaoh who was consumed by the chaos. Pharaoh, who was seen as being this semi-divine figure responsible for holding back the forces of chaos in that situation, he was unable to do that. Now, what we're going to see here at some point in the next three hours, what we're going to see here is that uh, as, as we begin we're going to hear about a kind of watery chaos. You're going to think, what is that talking about? And uh, one of the things to understand is that this text is actually uh, not only conveying a really rich theological message, but it's also in, in very deliberate conversation with a lot of uh, other ancient, with, with a lot of, um, uh, not other, but a, a lot of ancient Near Eastern uh, creation myths, and it's correcting those. It's kind of a polemic against those things. And in most of those myths, there is this, it begins with this watery chaos. And so this is saying something in a context, and it's just brilliant. The, the sophistication of this text, it stands out so marvelously in, in an ancient world where you get these weird creation stories of gods being split in two and the one half becomes the sky and the one half becomes the land or, um, you know, the, the sun god Ra sailing in his boat across the waters of the sky and really kind of fanciful stuff. And then we get this such a beautiful and sophisticated statement of monotheism, of this one creator God. It just seems to come out of nowhere, this, uh, this account. And that's because it is literally inspired. If ever, if ever there was a text that was inspired, oh, it, it, it's this one. Of course, I believe the whole Bible is inspired. But man, if ever there was a text that was so obviously inspired, this is it. Um, one of the other things, uh, I'm going to read it in a moment, actually, and I'm not going to, because uh, I'm, I'm going to actually read the whole chapter. Now, do you think we can handle uh, reading that much. It's going to be more than a tweet, I'm afraid, so I'm, now I'm going to really be stretching your concentration muscles uh, today, uh, but please try to stay with me. Um, if you have a Bible with you, uh, that would, it, you could follow along. I'm going to be, re I'm going to be reading from the NIV. Um, if you have a phone, you can pull up uh, your Bible app. Uh, if your phone doesn't have a Bible app on it, it's not a Christian phone, <laughs> um, so you better get one uh, on there. Um, Otherwise, it's fine. You can just, uh, you can just uh, listen. Now, right from the start, let me, uh, let me point out some of the literary features, and I want you to notice this as I read through, uh, through this chapter. Um, the, uh, the creation narrative uh, is, uh, is divided into six kind of panels, six days. And on the first three days, God creates space 
spaces that on the second uh, lot of three days, God fills, inhabits uh, those spaces. Now, this is all about order. At the beginning, we have this orderless, what, what's, it's referred to as formless and void. It's without order. And God is the only one, this is part of what this, this saying, God is the only one who can bring order to the chaos. The only one. And all of the actions of, that are described in this chapter are actions of God bringing order to chaos. And they're actions that are also... Uh, you'll, be, you'll find these actions in very important places uh, in the law. Man, I could really go uh, get uh, into this. Let me think. Uh, okay. And not only that, but the text itself is intricately, intricately ordered. That's what I mean when I say even the shape of the text expresses the message. Because even the, to- even the number of times that key words are used is even... Uh, there's an, even an order to this. The first sentence, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, there are seven words uh, in that first verse. Numbers are very important. Numbers uh, had a, a theological significance uh, in, in Hebrew thought. And the number seven expresses uh, perfection. There are a lot of sevens uh, throughout this chapter. Um, uh, seven times it says, and it was so, seven times. Um, it's related to, to the word amen. When we say amen, it's let it be so, like so be it. Um, seven times, and God saw that it was good. We, we have this seven-day period. This is very important because God is ordering the life of his people, and he's, it's going to be ordered around worship. Order, again, very, very important. There are, in this, uh, in this chapter, there are ten, ten, Divine commands. Can you think of anywhere else where there are 10 divine commands? The 10 commandments. Uh, tens are very important. There are 10 commandments, 10 plagues uh, on, uh, on Egypt. A lot of tens are in, around the tabernacle and so forth. I could go on about that. There are 10 times the phrase uh, in Hebrew, and God said 10 times. 10 times you have the statement that God created everything according to their kinds, according to their kinds, exactly 10 times. You have actions of separating, distinguishing things, separating and naming. Uh, And God separated and God called five times each to make 10 times for those related actions. Uh, The uh, five times it says God creates, five times it says God makes together. 10 times. You're getting the picture. This is an intricately ordered chapter. As I said, seven words in the first verse. Multiples of seven are important too. In the second verse, 14 words. There are 35 occurrences of the word God, Elohim, in Hebrew. So a lot of these features uh, come through in the Hebrew, not always in the English text. 35 uh, occurrences of the word God, five times seven. There are, in, on the seventh day, the culmination of this, there are 35 words, 35 words in that last section. I could go on and on, and I really feel like going on and on and on uh, about this, actually, because it's amazing how this is put together. So, but how about we, how about we read it? Actually, just one more thing. One of the other things, one of the other things uh, in, in Hebrew literature is that often they put the most important thing in the center. Um, you, you, you might be familiar, you might have seen a, um, a, a Jewish candle stand. Uh, it has seven candles, and it's, it has this central pole, and then there are three branches uh, on either side. Three, actually, is a, um, it tends to relate to divinity. But anyway, we'll... we'll um, and... and that's, it's, they have that sense of the three on either side with the central pole, and, and it kind of expresses the way that often Hebrew literature works, is that you often put the most important thing in the center. So, for example, the five books of Moses that start the New Testament, there are five books of Moses. The central book, Leviticus, is actually seen as, in a sense, the focal point. That's the focal point. Leviticus is the book that talks about the sacrificial law that we understand points to Jesus. And that's right in the center of the book. In the center of the book of Leviticus, if you go right to the center of the book of Leviticus, you have Leviticus chapter 16, and it's the Day of Atonement. 
right in the center. The most important things are put right in the center. Well, uh, what is in the center of this chapter is also going to be important. Okay, I'm exhausted already, goodness me. Okay. All right, you're with me? We're going to read uh, this chapter, and I may uh, make some points um, uh, on the way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty, okay? So no, no shape, no order. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I've explained the significance of the waters, the chaotic uh, ocean. And God said, everything begins with and God said. I'll talk about that more. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. It's interesting, just to, sorry, to, to pause here and point out something. It's interesting that God creates light on the first day, but light bearers on the fourth day. And when he creates the light bearers, he doesn't even call them by their usual names, uh, even in Hebrew. And that's because they were, uh, they were seen to be divine by people uh, in the ancient world. Uh, and in fact, the, the greatest gods of ancient Near Eastern pantheons tended uh, to be the sun and the moon gods, uh, particularly the sun god. Like, for example, in, in Egypt, it was the sun god Ra, because of course they, they, they sensed that the sun is the source of light and light is associated with life. But this text is saying, no, God is the source of life. And the sun and the moon are only light bearers. In fact, markers of something that's very important. Uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. And God said, let there be light and there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. This is the creation of our, of our atmosphere. And it was so. God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered, seas, and the gathered waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land uh, that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds. The trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning the third day. Do you sense a rhythm to this? All right, there's a rhythm and repetition. Let's go on. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark sacred times. That is the center of Genesis chapter 1. The fourth day where these lights mark seasons, times, sacred times in the, in the NIV, which is, a, which is a good rendering because what it's highlighting here is that the center is a life ordered around worship. A life ordered around worship. I mean, why are you even here today? You could be like out at the beach. It's a beautiful day uh, out there. You could be, uh, you know, lying on the beach this morning, but you're here. You're here instead. Why? Because you are prioritizing something. Because you've patterned your life around a rhythm, not just when you feel like it, uh, you know, uh, not just when it suits you, but you've oriented your life around a regular pattern of worshiping together with God's people. That's very important idea in the, in, in the law of God, which is going to follow the pattern uh, that God is going to set for the life of his people. It is a life ordered around worship, sacred seasons. 
And let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. Notice he doesn't use the na- even use the names there. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on earth, to govern the day and the night, to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and everything, uh, every living thing with which the water teems that moves about it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the water in the seas, let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, there was morning The fifth day, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground (coughs) according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, And this is the climactic moment of God's order. Now, at each point, uh, it says, and God saw that it was good seven times, but the the next time that God is going to say, that this text is going to say, and God saw that it was good, he's going to say, and God saw that it was very good. Why? Because the crown of creation is is now being created. The crown of creation. The one who is going to steward God's order. God has created a perfectly fine-tuned universe, a perfectly fine-tuned ecosystem, perfectly fine-tuned word, fine-tuned for life and for worship. And now he's going to set human beings uh, as, as it were, the gardener of the garden, the one uh, who is to steward his order. And this is what uh, it says. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. That's uh, a, a, a um, no, number of things I could say about that. That basically means they are his children. That's a massive claim in an ancient world in which human beings were just made as sort of a, a, an afterthought, as lowly servants of the gods, to feed the gods. Here, there is no higher view of humanity than there is in the Bible. And it starts right here, right in the first chapter. Um, uh, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them uh, and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Rule over the earth and subdue it is basically the same. Remember, this is, this is about establishing God's order in the lives, uh, in, in the world and in the lives of people. It's basically the same as what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28. Go into all the world, right? Fill the earth, go into all the world and make disciples. It's the same, exactly the same thing, really. It's stating that. Jesus is essentially stating this in a slightly more specific way. And God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Because it's everything in its right order. It's everything in its right place. Everything is good. This is a very, very important point. Everything in God's creation is good. But in the right order, that's when it all becomes very good. In Hebrew, tov ma'od, very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. God and then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is God is not resting here because he got 
tired. Uh, this is, this is a, a rest. Um, the kind of rest, it's, it's similar actually to the way that the, that similar phrase is used in the book of Kings when it describes uh, the godly kings uh, of Israel, of, uh, well, mainly Judah, but uh, when Israel was a united um, force. It says of them, and it, it says that God gave them rest from their enemies on every side. God gave them rest. And you know, it has a lot to do with the fact that they put their kingdom in order. And that means that they oriented the life of the kingdom around worship. And when they did that, people like Hezekiah and, and, and others, it says, and God gave them rest from their enemies on every side. Order is associated with rest. When things are in the right order, there is rest. Conversely, disorder causes turmoil. Disorder is the source, really, of evil in the world. Uh, one of the, one of the, uh, the, the key kind of issues about the, that, that people have um, discussed in relation to the Bible, you know, where does evil come from? If God created everything good, where does evil come from? Well, evil essentially is a disordering of God's hierarchy of goods. Everything is good. But when we take God's hierarchy of good things and we disorder them, that's when you get turmoil, unrest, destruction, Death sounds dramatic, doesn't it? And this is really, really important because it is getting things out of order, something we often do because we think, well, this is good, and that's good, and I should pursue that because that's good, and this is good. There's, you know, everything is good in, in itself, but when we get things out of order, turmoil ensues. And what God does here, he wants to do in our lives. This is not just what God did, this is what God does. This is the trajectory of your life. It begins with, and God said, in every situation of turmoil. And I'm sure, in fact, please tell me that you have patches of turmoil uh, in your life because that'll be encouraging to me. <laughs> Surely you have patches of turmoil. We all have patches of turmoil in our lives, don't we? There are certainly patches of turmoil in our world. Now, whatever the turmoil that is unfolding in your life, the bringing of order to that turmoil begins with, and God said, it begins exactly where, it begins exactly where this chapter begins. And God said. And in every situation, the thing that we need to focus on the first thing, before we rush about trying to solve the situation or play God, or, or the first thing we need to ask, what is God saying to me in this situation? What is God saying to me? God is first. Lord, what is your purpose in this situation? Every time we lose that, folks, every time we lose that, we will lose our peace. Every time you put your will before God's will, Every time you put what you want out of a circumstance, because now listen to this because we do this a lot. Every time we put what we want out of the circumstance before what God wants to do in the circumstance, I, I assure you, chaos will ensue. And you might say, oh, no, no, but this is really, this is good though. Like relationships are good. God wants us to have great relationships. But if you put your relationship with another person before your relationship with God. And here's the irony, good things get destroyed when we put them in a disordered relationship to one another. Every t and, and, and relationships are a great example of this. Every time you put your relationship with another person before your relationship with God. Now you might think, oh, but that, that somehow demotes relationships with other, other people. No, relationship, your relationships with others is too important to be put first. Because it is 
through your relationship with God, that you will be able to love people as people, that they won't need to give to you the things that only God can give to you. And you won't, try to be, you won't be trying to play God to them. These are the things that destroy relationships. Because relationships need to be in orbit around God. Remember, I used the illustration of putting God in the center and our lives need to orbit around God. We destroy good things. Every person here, God has put good things in your life. But if you don't submit those good things to God, if you don't put those good things in the right order, then you even destroy those good things. Every time you put people's expectations of you before God's expectations of you, I'm sure you've done that. You put people's expectations before God's expectations. Chaos will ensue. Turmoil will ensue from that. Every time you put objects and objectives before relationships in people, every time you put yourself before others, the disordering, the disorder that ensues will cause chaos and destruction. And you've got to ask yourself the question, in that patch of turmoil, the Spirit of God hovers over the turmoil of your life. And the answer, if you will take hold of it, the answer to that situation is what is God saying? Because when you receive what God is saying into that situation, then that is the beginning of order. Listen, there will always be turmoil around us. As long as this age, till the return of Christ, we will be surrounded by turmoil. But there can be peace in here. If you listen to the and God said, what is God saying to you? If you are rooted in what God is saying, if you, st if you continue to persevere in patterning your life around worship, whatever turmoil is going on out in the world, and I think that there's going to be more and more turmoil, I'm afraid uh, to say the turmoil's probably not going to go away until Jesus returns. And a lot of people are afraid of things that are going on in the world and the instability, political instability, environmental instability. There's, there's a lot of hopelessness out there. Do you sense that, actually? Don't you? There's a lot of chaos. All of God's order is being upset. It's got a lot to do with disorder, all of it. The order in the, in the, um, uh, in the ecosystems, in the environment, the order, political order, it's all being upset, right? And people are afraid. They're afraid. Walls of water. The seas have lifted up. The seas have lifted up their voice. But the psalm declares, but God is mightier than the great waters. God is mightier than the great waters. And if you put yourself in God, if you center your life in God, then you are in the eye of the storm. A thousand may fall by your side, the psalm says, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. It's not saying you won't suffer trouble and turmoil. You will, but in the midst of that, you can find peace because peace ensues from order. This is the remarkable thing. This is what distinguishes us as the people of God. That in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the storm, remember Jesus' parable of the storm. It hit both houses, didn't it? But it was the house built on the rock that did not fall. Why? Because Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. And God said, and we say, and so be it. Amen. It's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? This is something to build your life on. And I didn't go for three hours. You're witnesses to that. Now, we're, but I, there's one other thing that I'd like you to do. I'd like you to stand and get the music team uh, to come up. Talk about getting back to the fundamentals. The first and most important piece of turmoil and order that we need to sort out in our lives is that we need to get ourselves in the right position in relation to God. And Jesus came to make that possible. 
And we're going to meet Jesus in that place as a first step. Jesus came to bring reconciliation with God so that we could put God back in the center. We could bring ourselves back into that orbit. And that is what we celebrate when we take communion together. We're going to use this symbol this morning to celebrate that because of what Jesus has done, nothing, nothing can snatch us out of God's hands. Nothing from that place of peace. And as we eat the bread that represents Jesus' sacrifice, the security is that He paid, He earned it for us. You can't unearn what, you know, it's it's secure. The cup represents the shed blood of Jesus. It's like God's love poured out for you. So let's get ourselves deeply, deeply rooted in.